coming up on this week's Outdoor Elements. Hi, I'm Evie Kirkwood. And I'm Marie Lottman. We are going to explore in and around the Indiana Dunes National Lakeshore. We're going to paddle down the Little Calumet River. And visit a beautiful black oak savanna. But first, we discover a nature play zone. Outdoor Elements is presented in partnership with the St. Joseph County Parks Department, Cardinal Native Plant Nursery, the Indiana Department of Natural Resources, and the Indiana State Parks. It's a beautiful late summer day and being outside is a great way to enjoy nature and also there's a lot of benefits from it. And it's really good for children. And here I am with Indiana Dunes National Lakeshore, Kimberly Swift, who is the Director of Programs and Education here. And we are here at a nature play zone yes. that you've created. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us what is a nature play zone? Well, it's a special place here in our national park where kids can be kids. They can do the things that you and I probably did in our backyard or maybe in the you know farm field down the road. And nowadays, kids don't have those kinds of green spaces just everywhere where they can go dig around, build a fort, um, explore the woods on their own and, and really get creative. So how did you pick this location to be able to allow that? Well. It was kind of interesting. We were doing some cleanup and restoration around this area. You can't see from here, but our nature center, the Douglas Nature Center, is just right around this curve here. And we have a lot of school students coming here. Thousands of students and visitors come every year. And we cleaned out this area and we stumbled upon this lovely little sand blowout that had actually been created after two railroads had been here and then removed. So the railroads are gone. Um, but this little blowout was left and we were like, aha, here is our play zone. This is a great place for kids to just come play. And it's right here by the Nature Center. This is great. Let's go check it out. Here we are in the Nature Play Zone and I know that it took a lot of work to prepare this area. Kim, can you tell us more about what you had to do to prepare the site for kids to be romping around here? Right, right. Well, surprisingly, not very little um, because we, you know, this kind of a play zone is not a typical playground. We didn't build seesaws and sliding boards and things. It's more about natural elements. So really, um, we started out with a much smaller area the first year and we did a pilot test. And that worked out really well to get some feedback from teachers and from parents about what they liked and didn't like about the space. So the loose parts that you see around you, the rocks, the sticks, and you know any other little implements that we sometimes find and bring out are, are just the easy things that we bring for kids to play with. So you brought them from other areas within the park here to this place. Right. And we find that kids- a nice sport back yeah, here Yeah, exactly. Well. Yeah. And they, they get very, very creative and do a lot of problem solving, a lot of critical thinking skills, and it really, you see a huge amount of teamwork. All right, so here we are at another part of the Nature Play Zone, and it looks like we have some plants growing. So Kim, tell us more about what's going on here, a garden? Yeah, this is an urban gardening demonstration. Um, some of our volunteers and park staff are really knowledgeable about gardening and we started getting a lot of questions about that so they use this space as a great exploration space to test out and show some things so we they've they've started some little tomato plants there's a pepper plant back there we have our um, rain barrel with some drip irrigation coming down here to show how you can try to get things in sand growing here and then we have some raised beds uh, down this way and just to show people. So people come to your programs and they're mm -hmm. able to be a part of this gardening oh, right. as and well. The, and the, it's the idea too is the kids help. So we have a program called Nature Play Date in the Play Zone 
and it's every other Saturday. And so families come and they can keep coming every Saturday if they want. And again, it's just nature play um, on a Saturday morning. Yeah. So speaking of kids coming out here, working in the dirt, some parents might have a few safety concerns right. of working in the garden. Maybe there's poison ivy. I saw a prickly pear cactus on our walk over right. here. Tell me more how you guys have addressed those safety concerns. Well, that was a big question when we especially first started because, you know, an open area like this, poison ivy loves it in our habitat, right? So we had to get rid of it to begin with because poison ivy is one of those things that you don't know you have it until a couple hours later, a day or two later, and we didn't want families and kids to go home with that um, experience. So we were able to just cut out all the poison ivy and we have to come back in every spring do that just to make sure and we've been able to keep it under control. Now the prickly pear cactus and you know some of the other plants we leave because that's a pretty immediate thing that you learn if you touch a cactus it you know there's a little bit of a prick there and you don't do it again. Um, and so it's part of the learning experience to be able to learn and identify plants. And we also have a little plant identifier we send out here with, with families too, if they want to know what's growing in the play zone. Great. So you lead programs out here as yes. well to help uh, families feel more comfortable in right. this space. We have found that it's really the parents that need and require a little bit more education about the use of the play zone and, and teachers and caregivers. Kids instinctually know what to do out here. They just come and they play and they have a good time. Sometimes parents are a little reluctant because they're not used to this kind of a play, playground. And, but it usually doesn't take very long before they're also enjoying the space and then their kids are saying they don't want to leave. So if families want to come and learn about your programs and come out and enjoy this nature play zone, um, where should we direct them? Well, we have a website, um, www.nps.gov backslash indu. And so there's information about the Douglas Center and the play zone on there. And we have a calendar of events that shows all of our events that we have taking place throughout the park, but also in this space too. What a great opportunity for families to come out and enjoy the Indiana Dunes National Lakeshore and the Nature Play Zone. Right well, thank there. you for coming and playing with us today. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>
fire, right? I bet you use prescribed fire. Correct. Yeah. Every few years, this uh, this area gets burned uh, intentionally with controlled burns, prescribed fires. Yes. And do you like determine that by like looking at the canopy and thinking how dense it is, or or how do you how do you just say, okay, this we've got to burn, or this we've got to? Right. So we a number of things. We uh, you know we look at the area, um, just get an idea as to how how quickly the woody species are coming in. Good so if things are getting really thick and brushy, uh, we can use prescribed burn to kind of knock that back and prevent those young trees from growing up into mature trees and then increasing the amount of shade in the area. Um, at and, some and you actually have a little tool that helps you measure the canopy, right? Right, right. So this is a this is a densiometer. Densiometer, okay. Correct. In a and great so little box. Basically okay. oh, it's, it's a, like a mirror. It's right? a mirror. And what are you striving for, for coverage? And so for savanna, um, a good definition of oak savanna would be about 30% canopy cover. Okay. Um, and so once you use this and you see that it's more than 30% of essentially those squares, there's a little calculation you have to do, but essentially right. if, it's, if it seems to be more canopy covered, then you need to drop some of those big trees. That would be right? an indicator. If the area that in question that we're trying to manage is savanna, then you know if you end up with 80 percent, 90 percent canopy cover, then if you wanted to manage that area as a savanna, it would require removing some trees. Um, and the prescribed burns that we do are good at keeping uh, increase of um, canopy, but as far as like um, controlling the mature trees, we use other methods for that, including using chainsaws. Um, we have a track loader with the mower attachment that we use in areas that are really dense, yeah. but mostly brush cutters, uh, chainsaws. And sometimes you actually girdle a tree, right, where you actually cut um, all the way around the living tissue of the trunk of a right. tree? So one method would be uh, to leave the tree standing, which actually can provide habitat for, for a lot of yeah. species, like woodpeckers love, love the dead standing trees. But yeah, if you take a chainsaw and cut a, cut a groove around the tree through the bark, into the cambium of the tree, and then we'll actually use a herbicide, spray it in the cut surface. That way, we we kill the roots of the tree and prevent it from uh, from sprouting right. back. Correct. Yeah. Well, I know the crew is out working and trying to get rid of some invasive species. So let's go catch up with them and see what they're up to. Sounds good. What are some of the management tools and techniques you got? A, the natural resources crew is out here working today. So what are the what are the tools they're using, and what all is happening here? So we, we use a variety of methods based on the the, the plant that we're treating. Um, we do foliar applications of herbicides. That's what you're seeing people using the backpack sprayer, spray, right? So that's a herbicide applied to the leaves of the plant that gets absorbed and drawn into the plant, and then kills the plant all the way down to the root. Uh, we're also doing a stump application. So for woody species, uh, oftentimes what we do is we cut them either with a pair of loppers or with a brush cutter. And then um, in order to keep it from re-sprouting and growing back, we actually apply herbicide to the cut surface of the stump. Okay, and the, the when you actually spray the chemical, I noticed it has like a blue color. So that's right. like a marker, right? Yes, yeah, so the blue color is a dye that we add to the, to the uh, product so that we can tell where we've treated and what we haven't treated so that nothing gets missed and nothing gets sprayed more than once. More than once, so mm -hmm. you're not overusing the chemical, Correct. right, which is Correct. important. Uh, with the brush cutter, then basically somebody's following around with a little squirt bottle to cut the, right. or to treat the cut stem, Yeah, right? sometimes we have, um, depending on the tool being used, the person could actually do the cutting like with loppers or hand shears and then apply it um, right afterwards. but. It's oftentimes more efficient to have two people, one using a piece of equipment like the brush cutter, and then a second person following up with, uh, with the herbicide application. Now, when you are working in a specific area, I imagine you want to follow up in a subsequent season to see if you had success, you need right. to come back. So how do you find the spot again? How do you, because you, you're managing 700 acres of savanna, right. how do you know where you've been or how do you know where you've treated? Right, so uh, we, every, everything that we do here, we generally map with uh, GPS units. Uh, they have a data dictionary, basically, that prompts the uh, user to collect certain pieces of uh, data, like what kind of uh, uh, herbicide was used, what concentration, what species was uh, being treated. And so then, because we rarely kill the entire population with the first treatment, uh, we use that data for the crews next year. 
Uh, they use the same GPS unit, the same data to navigate back to the same patches. And then they can treatment. check. Correct. Okay. Correct. And some of the things that are getting removed here today, I, I see um, the Asiatic Bittersweet, Oriental right. Bittersweet. Right. What else is? What um, else are they trimming out? So the crew with the brush cutter, they're probably cutting some uh, black locust. Um, we have Tree of Heaven here. We've got Autumn Olive as far as woody species, and like you mentioned. Uh, the foliar application they're doing is to uh, Oriental Bittersweet. Oriental Bittersweet. Yep. Okay. All right. Great. Well, let's keep exploring the savannah because it's a great place. Right. Well, the obviously the crew's work is what really makes the savannah so spectacular. How long has uh, the National Lakeshore been managing Miller Woods in the savannah? Uh, Miller Woods area, I know we've been back to the mid-1990s. We started working on the invasive plant control treatments. Wow. Uh, we did a big project recently in uh, 2014 starting to do a little bit more of the canopy um, adjustments here. Um, so yeah, it's been a number of years. And the, obviously the efforts show. What would happen if you stopped, stopped all the management? So we stopped uh, doing periodic burns um, and doing any kind of uh, treatments for woody species. Probably what would happen then is that we'd see an increase in the woody species density and then eventually this would probably convert into like more of a forested type. Um, so that would mean probably loss of, of the, all the species that require open sun. Open so sunlight. the prairie species would, would, would start to disappear. Right, and that means then the insects change, which means the birds right, change, right. and yep. then you, you sort of sort of collapse that little ecosystem. Correct, so, correct. Well, I certainly thank you so much for sharing the story of the Black Oak Savannah here at Miller Woods at the Indiana Dunes National Lakeshore. I encourage folks to come out, hike the trails, visit the park's website to find out more about savannas and all the great habitats that you have here. And thanks for your work. Thanks sure, so much. Thank you. Thanks for visiting. Here we are on the banks of the Little Calumet River on a beautiful day, and we are glad to be joined with Kathy Martin, who is the program manager from the Save the Dunes Council. Kathy, can you tell us a little bit about where we are in relation to the National Lakeshore? Sure. Right now we are on the East Branch of the Little Calumet River. We are on Wyke's Plampin. It's the Shirley Heinz Land Trust property. The East Branch of the Little Calumet River starts at Red Mill County Park, and that's in LaPorte and it flows westward through Chesterton, Portage, and eventually empties into Lake Michigan. It goes through the Indiana Dunes National Lakeshore as well as several other Shirley Heinz Land Trust properties. So it's an extensive yes, uh, it work here to try to open up the little Calumet so folks can paddle it, which we're gonna get to do here in a little bit, uh, which yes. I am excited. Yes, very excited. So you mentioned a number of the partners, mm -hmm. uh, Shirley Heinz, National Lakeshore, Save the Dunes, etc. What what was the capacity of all those mm -hmm. partners? So we all got together a number of years ago to talk about accessibility on the East Branch of the Little Calumet River. And together, Save the Dunes, Shirley Heinz Land Trust, the National Park Service, and the Northwest Indiana Paddling Association put in a grant to the Shy Cal Rivers Fund partners. And that was to put in kayak launches, restore riparian habitat, and open up stretches of the river for paddling. And so all together, we work under that grant, and we would have been doing it anyway, but it's a really, really fantastic funding opportunity that has allowed us to restore hundreds of acres and improve accessibility. Yeah, and I was gonna ask how many acres in total have been uh, conserved through this effort, do you know? So there are several different levels of conservation in this. We have Shirley Heinz Land Trust, who is acquiring a lot of acreage along the East Branch of the Little Calumet River. They're calling it a conservation corridor. They have put hundreds of new acres in the last couple of years into protection along this waterway. And so in addition to acquisition, we're also restoring land. Shirley Heinz has restored a couple hundred acres of um, land along the East Branch of the Little Calumet River at their Dale B. Inquist property, as well as properties like Coulter, which is in the Portage area. And the National Park Service restored about 200 acres on their stretch of the Little Calumet River, removing invasive species and also removing dead ash tree. Yeah. This area saw a lot of dead ash from the emerald ash borer, and it's a huge safety concern for our paddlers and our hikers. Right. Right. So about 20 acres of dead ash were removed to help really increase um, safety for our visitors. Excellent. Yeah. Well, we're pretty excited to be able to go paddle, right? Yes. Uh, and um, I know that Dan Plath is here. He's, I think he's going to be our guide. Yes. 
And we're gonna launch right here because right here at Wikes Pamplin there is one of these great accessible launches that there folks can use. So yeah. we think it's great that Save the Dunes and all of you have kind of partnered together to make this happen because it's sort of a little undiscovered gem for a lot of folks, right? It That's is. beautiful scenic paddling corridor. So yeah. are you ready? I'm ready. All right. Great. <laughs> Kathy, thanks so much for giving us an overview and we're gonna head to the launch. Sounds great, have fun. Now we're with Dan Plath, and you've got a couple of different titles, Dan. You are... I'm the Chief of Resource Management with the Indiana Dunes National Lakeshore. But you're also a big paddler. Yeah, I helped uh, found the Northwest Indiana Paddling Association in 2009. I was the uh, president of the organization until I took my role about two years ago with the National, National Lakeshore. Lakeshore. So, uh, I, uh, my official title is volunteer. Oh, awesome. <laughs> Volunteers make the world go around, I'm convinced. So you have been instrumental in helping make this possible, this paddling possible, right? So what kind awesome of work? Us the Paddling Association. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what kind of work did you actually have to do? So when we uh, took, took over this, or took this on as a project, uh, it's almost about 10 years in the making to get to where we are right here. The river hadn't been maintained in close to 40 years. Mm. There was hu literally hundreds of large log jams all the wow. way along here. A tornado came through in 2009 and had put, you know, multiple very large diameter trees in the, in the river. So it's been a huge effort. Uh, each year we're putting in uh, six to 800 uh, volunteer hours and man hours of uh, time into getting the river opened up. It's, like a little section at a time. Yeah, it, what we do is it's called the pulmonar method of restoration. So this is, we learned this from the Northwest Indiana Steelheaders. It's a fish friendly way of taking out enough uh, woody debris that uh, you can get safe passage through, get the water moving, get paddlers to be able to go through. But the vast majority of the woody debris is still left in the river. Uh, so it helps with the macroinvertebrates, with the fish species. It actually, you can kind of uh, scour the bottom in areas to make it deeper and better habitat for the fish. So that's kind of our technique awesome. that we've been using. So Dan, with all this hard work, is it pretty amazing to see your work paying off with different species of animals? Maybe some new mussels? To a couple things that we're just discovering, uh, 52 years of it being a national park, but about the last uh, 30 some without people out here using the river, uh, there, we discovered something in the river we didn't know we had. We thought that they were extinct. Uh, we have uh, found live mussel beds in the river. Wow. Nothing That's... federally uh, listed, but that being said, these are native mussels to Indiana. We think it, uh, right now about four species uh, there's evidence of. I personally found uh, the first live bed out here, but we're actually out doing mussel surveys right now in the river as we speak to see what else we have. So it's pretty exciting. Uh, you know, it, because there's something here that we didn't know about. And I think it's good evidence that the water quality uh, has uh, improved. In 2009, there was a pretty thorough survey what was done of the river. And at the time, uh, they found no evidence of live mussel beds in the river. Uh, so it's so, a comeback story. So yeah, speak, and yeah. I think a lot has changed since then. Uh, Save the Dunes with their watershed management plan, mm -hmm. uh, all these groups working on uh, preservation along the river has greatly uh, eliminated and reduced a lot of the sediment and runoff what we're running into the river. Likely they were always there, maybe in little pockets here and there or up in the tributaries, but yeah. now it looks like they're a little bit more mm -hmm. widespread. And actually just past where we're at, at at this point, is another spot I was planning on doing some investigating because I suspect that there's some more mussels over here. I found a couple shells where the uh, uh, where it was still linked, so they're uh, recent dead mussels. Wow, very so cool. Mussels are very intolerant to pollution. Yes. Then as well, right? Yes. Generally speaking, they're they're kind of like uh, you know the canary in the coal mine or the amphibian, something mm -hmm. like that. They're a filter feeder. So if you have too much sediment, you have too much runoff. Uh, problems like that, um, those are things that, that cause problems for mussel species. So we, uh, uh, apparently these are pretty hardy mussels because they've been able to survive. This river fluctuates 
Uh, this bridge we're going over, for example, back in February, the river was literally going over the top oh, of Oh, I that. bet, in the spring floods, right? Yeah, with the yeah. spring flooding. Yeah. So, Dan, there's probably a misconception about the Calumet River being dirty, but obviously the woods, the surrounding banks are all vegetated, and that probably absorbs runoff and pollutants and helps keep the river pretty clean, right? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, a lot of what we've done, the property we just left, is a Shirley Hines Land tr uh, Trust. Uh, it's a large wetland complex, and we'll be paddling into another one that helps filter that. Yeah. So the land preservation effort really does help uh, help clean the river. And um, you know, I, I like to make the analogy: our wetlands are like the kidneys in our in our body of of our water body. So the wetlands actually help filter everything out, just like the kidneys do in your body. Um, so that, that's that been a, a tremendous uh, help with, with this effort with how much land has been preserved along here. All right, thanks for being with us on the show today. We had a chance to discover a nature play zone. And the black oak savanna was gorgeous. It was great to see all those prairie species in bloom. Yes, and then we got to paddle down the Little Calumet River. For more information, check out the Outdoor Elements website. And remember, you can find your own outdoor elements when you visit area parks and nature centers. We'll see you next time. For more information on this and other episodes, go to the Outdoor Elements website at wnit.org backslash outdoor elements. Catch up on recent episodes and find additional resources like hands-on activities and informational PDFs. It's one more way to help you find your own outdoor elements when you visit area parks and nature centers. Elements is made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you.